A calorimeter is an object used for calorimetry or the process of measuring the heat of chemical reactions or physical changes as well as heat capacity. This is the world's first ice calorimeter used in the winter of 1782 and 83. The experiments he conducted with his device mark the foundation of thermochemistry. A bomb calorimeter is a type of constant volume calorimeter used in measuring the heat of combustion of a particular reaction. Bomb calorimeters have to withstand the large pressure within the calorimeter as the reaction is being measured. Electrical energy is used to ignite the fuel. As the fuel is burning, the heat increases and the change in temperature allows for calculating calorie content of the fuel. This is our calorimeter. For best results with this type of calorimeter, we recommend a thermometer marked as one-tenth degree centigrade intervals, which we do not have. Changes in heat energy can be measured using a device called the calorimeter. The calorimeter is made of two chambers. The inner chamber is partially filled with water. The temperature of the water is recorded. The material being tested is then placed in the water. The heat given off by the sample is, absor is absorbed by the water. This transfer of heat causes the temperature of the water to rise. A thermometer in the water shows the change in temperature. The amount of heat gained by the water is equal to the amount of heat lost by the sample. Precision calorimetry requires extensive correction for errors including the following. Thermometers are not exact and must be calibrated against accepted standards. Thermometers do not respond immediately. Lag. Heat is lost by transfer and evaporation. Heat is absorbed by metal parts. Heat is added by stirring. The specific heat of water differs with thermometers. Note, excessive heat loss may be caused by corrosion or replacement in a drafty area. If heat loss experienced with these cal calorimeters is excessive, place a simple heat shield of aluminum foil along the inner wall of the outer can. So calorimetry is a very refined and requires a lot of precision. And so our calorimeter is not exactly made for that, but it's good practice for learning how to use one that might prove more precise. So here we are with sodium hydroxide and aluminum. Sodium hydroxide is on the pH scale, but it's very, very basic. It, it's also known as lye, and you can see that on the scale there. So here we have the calorimeter. We put sodium hydroxide in it. We've added aluminum. After a little while, it starts to foam a little bit. We got a tiny bit of reaction. Our sodium hydroxide solution is, is so weak that the reaction was very slow. So we went back to hydrogen, uh, hydrochloric acid in aluminum, which hydrochloric acid is on the pH scale, and it's extremely acidic. And so here I am, I cut up some aluminum, I put it in the calorimeter and in a flask so we could see the reaction. And I know this one gets extremely hot and there it is steaming up and I was trying to capture it but the, the level was going up so fast it was moving but it, it leveled out, it topped out at about 95 degrees Celsius. That's 95 degrees Celsius, it gets very hot and we'll try it with lye once we get a higher concentration. Here we are with potassium permanganate, one of the chemicals I, I wanted to focus on. And we're doing elephant toothpaste, but if you use yeast, is an exothermic reaction. And so we use yeast and we use the potassium permanganate and it only comes out okay. It turns out that the potassium permanganate isn't the key ingredient. It's the strength of the hydrogen peroxide that really matters. And that's what we're going to put in here. And we're just putting in the normal... 3% that you can buy at the store, and it just doesn't do what it needs to do. Oh, well, that's probably too much. Um, it's probably good, right? Come on. Do it. Pull, do it. Pull that hook. Oh, there you go. Hey, all right. That's not bad. It's a little thicker this time. Still, the concentration of the permanganate and the concentration of the hydrogen are just so low, it doesn't have a reaction. Oh, very good. I'm going to put a thermometer in it. It's 20 now. 
20 degrees Celsius now. And we'll just wait and see. The yeast one's hotter. The yeast one might be hotter. Let's try the yeast one and we'll compare it. It went from 20 to 24. 20, let's see. I'd say 23 or 24. So let's mark that down and then I'll clean up and we'll come back and do the one. Okay, here we are. We're gonna use the calorimeter. Say it with me, calorimeter. <laughs> That's a tricky word, calorimeter, calorimeter. Oh, like crazy. Calorimeter. We're gonna use a calorimeter to measure the temperature change of this chemical reaction, which if it absorbs heat or if it's cold or what we perceive as cold and call cold is what's happening? And absorbing heat. It's absorbing heat, which would make it what kind of reaction? Endothermic. Endothermic, all right. Cut it open. I was trying to make a funnel, but we pull out our ingredients and I'll read them off. We've seen this before. Pour some into my hand here so we can kind of see what they're like. They're just little pellets. So we'll use one, one half. Let's use one. One half of whatever that is. All right. So one teaspoon. Okay, one teaspoon. And the ingredients for this are calcium ammonium nitrate. Most calcium ammonium nitrate is used as fertilizer. Fertilizer grade can calcium ammonium nitrate contains roughly 8% calcium and between 21 and 27% nitrogen. Can is preferred for use on acid soils as it acidifies soils less than many common nitrogen fertilizers. Calcium ammonium nitrate has seen use in improvised explosives. The can is not used directly but is instead first converted to ammonium nitrate. More than 85% of the improvised explosive devices used against U.S. forces in Afghanistan contain homemade explosives. And of those, about 70% are made with ammonium nitrate derived from calcium ammonium nitrate. And here you can see that reaction to get for the cold pack gets really cold. It went to about nine degrees Celsius. Here we are trying to make a color change, a chameleon change, uh, with potassium permanganate and sodium hydroxide and some sugar. And each time we make this recipe, it comes out differently. So the first time we did it, it actually almost went clear. And the subsequent times, we actually I, there's a precipitate in there, like a solid. It's pretty interesting. It's kind of like a recipe that you have to get right on to make it really come out clear, which is the goal. All right, so really quickly, this was a uh, copper coil, just a piece of raw, uh, raw copper that I put in there, and I put it in with vinegar, and you can see it turned green. The other one that I had in this beaker that was crystallized was with hydrochloric acid, and that had turned green and brown, and so I tried to regenerate those crystals by adding water and then electrolyzing them, but I wasn't getting any flow of electricity. I'm not sure if it was the batteries or the lack. I, I even added salt to the solution so that it might help as an electrolyte, but I didn't get any reaction really. Anyway, I poured out that solution onto a piece of cardboard, hoping maybe that the copper might deposit into the cardboard and I'll let it dry and expose it to the elements and see if it, see if it uh, turns green again. So we'll add electricity to this in a little while and see what happens there. In the meantime, we're going to take some of our recently casted and uh, poured aluminum bronze, which is just a lot of aluminum mixed with a little bit of copper. And it's, it's terribly brittle, so we had some pieces break off. And so I'm going to put those into the beaker here with a flask. And then I'm going to add hydrochloric acid. And, and normally I would add the muriatic acid, which is really powerful, and it would speed the transition. But just because I haven't been able to get to the school for that supply right now, we're going to use this, which came with the Chemtech kit. And it seems to be a pretty uh, powerful solution. Uh, we used it to show the heat, the exothermic reaction of, of reacting with aluminum that we had done in the lab previously. And it worked. It raised the temperature quite a bit and produced quite a bit of hydro, uh, hydrogen, which we could have captured into a balloon. Although I don't know if the reaction was powerful enough to expand a balloon, which is interesting in itself. But it did get hot. I think 60 degrees Celsius using the cal calimeter, calorimeter. And so there we go, we have uh, hydrochloric acid with our aluminum and our copper, and we'll see what happens. We know that aluminum reacts pretty powerfully, and then copper reacts slower, but very effectively on copper with hydrochloric acid, which we s we've seen in the pennies that have been sitting there. And now the dime is actually coming out, and I'm gonna move it very gently into camera view. And every time I disturb it, I haven't disturbed this or agitated it. It, or I have very little, and it's been in there for, I don't know, two months, and you can see, maybe, I don't know, I can't tell, but even the dime, the, the dime is starting to uh, release its copper, and it's starting to form these, like, crystalline structures outside of the, the coin structure, so we'll see what happens with this, I'll, I'll agitate this one, I'm not going to just let it sit, because I want to speed up the, the reaction, adding a little bit of energy to it, I'll probably uh, put a cork in that, maybe, um, if I can find one, and I'll put it in the sun to add a little bit of energy, maybe see if that increases the reaction. When I get more flasks, I'll put a bigger piece 
I'll put the flask shape of this aluminum bronze into a bigger flask and I'll put a cork in it and we'll just let it sit and, and see what happens without agitating it and see the differences in what is produced. To find the enthalpy change per mole of a substance A in a reaction between two substances A and B, the substances are separately added to a calorimeter and the initial and final temperatures before the reaction has started and after it has finished are noted. Multiplying the temperature change by the mass and specific heat capacities of the substances gives a value for the energy given off or absorbed during the reaction. Dividing the energy change by how many moles of A were present gives its enthalpy change of reaction.